Nathan, let's go back. What would you like to get out of a course or a seminar lecture called It's All About Leadership? I, I would expect to learn something about leadership. Um, Anything in particular? Specifically um, how one gains leadership. How one gains leadership. Okay. What would you like to get out of it? What's your name again? Meredith. Meredith, what would you like to get out of it? How maybe I could become a better leader. How you could become a better leader. Okay. Um, you're going back to Norway, probably. You're going to lead there? Probably. What would you like to take back with you? Knowledge of the international market. Knowledge of the international market. Maybe we need a leader to lead the international market, okay? So we could do something with our banking system, okay? Good. Uh, what would you like to... What, what interests you? Just a better understanding of leadership as a whole. Okay. Well... <sighs> Let me start. Please stop me any time you would like me to engage farther in what I'm saying. Okay? Now, I don't come here as any kind of expert, and I don't have expertise. I don't know what that stuff means. I just like to share information with students, leaders, others. Okay? So, I don't know everything. But I have people who do, working with me, or I know, and I'm sure we can get some information should you ask a question that I can't answer. It wouldn't be the first time I couldn't answer a question. Probably won't be the last. Let's start. I'm going to ask you a question. Do we have a problem when I tell you the following? From research in 2008. In 2008, a national survey of American workers showed the following. Only 29% of American workers were what would be called fully engaged on the job. 71% of the workers were found to be only partially engaged. And of those 71%, 19% were found to be disengaged. Wow. Is that a leadership problem? Your guess is as good as mine, but it's certainly food for thought. How about the following? A year ago, a professor from the State University of New York at Oswego did a national, national survey, and he found that the, in America, we are becoming less civil to each other. We are becoming less civil to each other. I require a book in one of my classes called Choosing Civility by Fornai. Now, isn't it interesting? I find it interesting that I really have to have my students learn more about civility. Why? Because where are they going to learn it? We have a national survey telling us that as Americans, we are becoming less civil to each other. I even recommend that we should take two words out of the dictionary. Thank you. When's the last time you were thanked for something you did? It all boils down to this. Think about it. It probably has something to do with leadership. So I'm going to say the following. Nations rise and fall on the basis of leadership. Companies rise and fall on the basis of leadership. Families rise and fall on the basis of leadership. Think about it. The great French philosopher Voltaire is often credited with this comment. An organization is the lengthened shadow of the leader. I repeat, Voltaire is often credited with this. I'm not sure he's the author, but he's credited with it on many occasions. An organization is the lengthened shadow of the leader. I want to share with you, in a practical matter, how this could even work. Many years ago, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Carl F. Frost from Michigan State University was hired by a Fortune 50 company to work in North Carolina at a new facility they were developing. And I had an opportunity to work with him for three years. He taught me that indeed Voltaire's idea may have great validity. Dr. Frost could walk through an organization of 1,000 or 2,000 people, 
Just walk around, look at people, and just merely ask a simple question. What time is it? What day is it? What time have you got? Can you tell me the day it is? Then find the janitor and ask, how are things going around here? That's all he did. He could then write a 10-page report on the leader's behavior without ever having met him with incredible accuracy. Leadership cascades from the top down. I repeat, leadership cascades from the top down. It's this simple. Leadership is probably everything. More books are written annually probably about leadership than any other topic except these days investments and money. There are more books, more articles, more journal articles. Harvard Business Review is almost totally dedicated to articles on leadership. New programs in colleges and universities on leadership. Even our own Western Kentucky University has developed a program, a doctoral program on leadership. Leadership is in. I repeat, leadership is in. But here's a problem. The literature on leadership is vast. Vast. How do you remember it all? I, I have no idea. I have no idea. It is vast. Do you think I remember all the studies I had to recite in my doctoral to get, to get my degree? I don't think so. So the question is, what do we do? since the information is vast. In 1929, a Harvard educator by the name of Alfred North Whitehead made the following comment. He said, information keeps about as well as dead fish, 1929. We now know today from studies in educational psychology, you're not going to remember everything. So my thought is this, what can we remember of everything we read? Well, I'm a little older than most people in here. And I can say the following. I trade on the following piece of information for me. Less is more. Less is more. For example, if you read a book and you can retain one good idea from that book that you could find useful, you've gotten your money's worth. Just imagine if you owned 500 books and you had 500 useful ideas. It would be magnificent. You won't remember them all anyway. Let's go back to Alfred North Whitehead. He said, knowledge keeps about as what dead fish. Well, what is the definition of knowledge? Knowledge is the bare accumulation of facts. You won't remember them. But here's a very important word that you will find in great leaders. It's called wisdom. Wisdom is different from knowledge. Wisdom is the artful use of knowledge. Whatever you can remember, whether it's one, two, three, four percent of everything that you have ever learned, if you could use it wisely, it will be very effective for you. Now, there's a difference between recognition and recall. Recalling is tough, recognition is easier. But to be able to recall all the facts, everything you heard, better to get one idea. For example, if today after all my ranting and raving, you come out of here with one useful idea, your time was well spent. One. I tell people if you, you know, you get one idea from a book, you got your money's worth. If you get two ideas, get your checkbook out and send the publisher a check. <laughs> you did very well. My philosophy is, is this again, less is more. And I want to share it with you. If I'm out in the business world, working with a group of leaders, I like to show them that less is more. So I like to ask questions and get them to respond. Why, the finest way to get people to learn is to get them engaged. So, let's say I've got a group of eight or ten people. The most important thing that one can do is get them engaged. So I ask this question. Are leaders born or made?
are they born or made? Okay. Well, let me share with you, because if I get into that interaction with you, we will never get through one-third of the information I've got for you. So here we go. I Do me a favor. If you have tomatoes, hold them until I'm through, before you throw them. Okay? But let's start with the following. Before anything happens, you have to be born. Accept it? Okay? We, we don't have spirits becoming leaders. Okay? You have to be born. So... We take that as a given. You're born. But what is it that we know you are born with? You are born with immense potential. Immense potential. Only a fraction of which most of us will develop. Even the great Einstein said in something that he wrote, the chances are nobody ever develops any more than 15% of it. That's even a lot. But that's a guy with probably an IQ of over 200 saying that. Okay? And so therefore, are they born or made? Well, I have a lot of leaders out there telling me, well, of course they're born. There's such a thing as a born leader. And I say, that's wonderful. If you say that and you uh, believe that, then you'll have to agree that there's such a thing called a born, that there's a, a born gene. You're born with a certain gene, a gene for leadership. You'll have to agree. If leadership is, uh, you know, if, if we are born that way, that means it's, we've inherited a leadership gene. But if you agree with that, you'll have to agree that there's going to be a medical gene, there's going to be a professor's gene, there's going to be a banker's gene, there's going to be lots of genes for different things. So we could do the following. We could develop a test and find out whether you've got that gene. And if you haven't got that gene, we would say, out. No sense spending any money on you because you haven't got it. You'll never get it. The answer in most of the research is the following. Leadership is an acquired skill. You can learn to be a good leader. That's why you're going back to Norway being a good leader. You can learn it. Leaders are made. There's very, very little evidence. There are a few authors who say they're born. But the majority of the research is in the direction of leaders are made. Leadership is an acquired skill. If that's not the case, then why do we have programs on leadership? Why do we even have this program right here? If you're born, then why waste time? Tell your parents, you know, find out if you've got that gene. If you haven't got that gene, they can save money. It's an acquired skill. Next question I like to ask leaders is, exactly what is a leader? And again, I'm after the, I'm after the, the, the response, less is more. Well, I get all kinds of answers. What is a leader? They give me book and verse. This is very simple. A leader is the one who is responsible for obtaining group or organization goals. Pure, plain, and simple. The leader is responsible for gaining the goals, for, for obtaining the goals. That's simple. If a whole organization fails, they're not going after everybody. They're going after the top person, the person who's responsible for moving, for, for getting those goals. And so next is, what is the, what is the work of a leader? Uh, what, so let, me, let me go back. What is the role of a leader? I ask them. Oh, they give me all kinds of things. I'm going to recite the words of Peter Drucker, probably the greatest name in management consulting. Drucker says... The role of a leader is, watch how simple this is. The role of a leader is gathering followers. Wow. 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 Gathering followers. Wow, that's phenomenal. You could write a thousand words on that. Gathering followers. Magnificent thinking this guy had. And now finally, the last one I ask is, what is the work of the leader? That is very simple. The work of the leader is moving all of those followers to obtain those goals. That's his or her work. How does the leader do this? He's going to do it in two ways. She's going to do it in two ways. One is through authority. And the other one is through power. Ah! Say, aren't they the same? Not according to this professor. They are different. Authority is the legitimate right to force, to make, to require, to obligate somebody to do something. It's legitimate. It comes with a title. Even clothing suggests authority. 
If the policeman stops you, you don't roll your window down and say, by what authority are you stopping me? How dare you? You don't do that. We understand. Authority means obligation. Authority means obligation. Power is different. Let's go back to authority. Let's go back to authority in the business world. Authority obligates. And when you do not measure up, authority has the right to discipline us. And in the business world, they discipline us by demotions, discharges, some form of penalty. That goes with not obeying authority. Call it whatever you want. I want to stay with authority for another moment before I go to power. Organizations that trade on authority, and all organizations have authority. Western Kentucky University, there's authority here. We have a president, we have a vice president, we have deans. They all have authority. How many of you knew that during World War II, how did Germany require those millions and millions and millions of troops to suffer through some of the worst winters in history in Russia? How did they do that? It's very simple. The German military executed 12,000 plus military personnel to enforce discipline. I repeat executed 12,000 plus military personnel to enforce discipline. In other words, under authority, you will do it or else. And there are some authorities whereby the penalty is pretty high. In the battle for Stalingrad, very interesting, Stalin had advised his troops, there will be a penalty if you go backwards. We are going forward. If you do not go forward, you will be shot. We are going to win this battle. Over 10,000 Russian troops were shot going backwards. There was a penalty. The suggestion was, we're going forward and we're going to win. And of course, win they did. And many historians state that the battle for Stalingrad was the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. And was the beginning of the end of the war in general. The second way of gaining followers to move to the goal is what I would call power. In many quarters, power is a dirty word. No, it isn't. Power is a capacity to influence the behavior, physical and thinking behavior of another. Power is a capacity, and power is desirable. I repeat, power is desirable. Power and authority are not the same. What one can do with power is amazing. One can do things with power that authority would have to put a whip knife or a gun in the back of someone to do. Author power can get it done voluntarily. For example, Gandhi of India. What authority did Gandhi have? None. By golly, what influence he had, which led to immense power, enough of power to rid India of the British. Now, if he had had an army, hey, the British army was one of the best in the world, if not the best in the world at the time, it might not have worked. But he developed influence, and ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> under influence, you get power, and with that power, people voluntarily will commit themselves to your leadership. They will walk through hot coals for you, and you don't even have to ask them. Take a look at Martin Luther King Jr. He had no authority, but look at the influence he has had. How about Jesus Christ as man on earth? His influence is felt to this day. What about Mother Teresa? No authority, great influence. How about Eleanor Roosevelt? the wife of the President of the United States. Great influence. How about Michael Jordan? Yes, Michael Jordan. The business world has used Michael Jordan's influence for sales. Haven't you seen him with a Wheaties at... Did you eat your Wheaties today? 
How about the second one? Are you wearing Hanes and all the men start, I don't know, have, am, I, am I wearing Hanes? Michael Jordan says I should wear them. That works. It's influence. Boy, what we could do with influence is unreal. Okay, let me stop. In an organization, influence is a ton better than authority. But are we going to be naive as to believe that out of a hundred people, the leader is a person who has developed great influence, that out of the hundred people, one hundred will accept his or her influence? And the answer is no, let's not be naive. But let me tell you on the basis of experience. Out of those, excuse me, out of those hundred people, I dare say 90 will accept the leader's influence. Ten probably will not. So I'm going to ask you this. Here is a leader who's got the qualities and characteristics I'm going to point out that lead to developing this influence. And yet these ten or eight or seven, small number in comparison to the total, they just do not follow this leader's influence. They will not be, they, they just won't. They're defiant. They don't like rules. They like to do things their way. If the organization is going north, they like going south. They're that way. So I'm going to ask you, what do we do with them? Because that figure I gave you is theoretical, which means you can't get rid of them and get some to take their place. There will always be that small minority. What do we do with them? What do you think? Talk to me. What are you going to do? Okay, I'm one of them. I just defied you. You told me that I, it's 4th of July, and you just told me I need to come to work on the 4th of July, and I said, you crazy? I'm not coming to work tomorrow. It's unfair. This company is unfair. You, lady, you are unfair. Now what? <laughs> and I say to you, you better talk to somebody else. Because I ain't coming in tomorrow. What are you going to do to me? What are you going to do to me? You talk to me. And guess what? As you're talking to me, I say, got anything else to say? I'm not coming in. You're going to bribe me now? Because if you give me that incentive, you have to give it to everybody else who's going to obey and come in because they want to. I'm giving you a dilemma, deliberately. And this is a tough one. These people probably only understand some sort of discipline or force. Why? Let me tell you something. Um, dealing with difficult people. A fellow by the name of Bramson wrote a book, Coping with Difficult People, B-R-A-N-S-O-N, or B-R-A-M-S-O-N, I can't remember. He makes the following point, which is very interesting. He says that there are people who believe that if you're decent, you are weak. So therefore, he says, these people see niceness as weakness, and they disrespect weak people. Which means you're going to have to show them some kind of um, courage. You're going to have to do something like, excuse me, it's not an option. You're going to have to come here. And if you don't come here, you know, I've tried to be decent. Everybody's coming. I'm going to provide sandwiches and all that for everybody. We need you here. Production is up. We need you here. It's in our contract that if we call for work on these days, you would come. And I want to show you. This is your signature. You signed this. So therefore, if you're not here, there will be a penalty. You will, be, you will be docked three days' pay. You've got to do something to get their attention, because if you don't, they'll consider you as weak. So my point is, how... You know, you're not going to get 100% of anything, but you have to be prepared to deal with that small percentage 
who will defy. I still maintain this is the best form of leadership, even though you've got a title, because you're going to find that many people with titles are still pretty decent people and don't trade on their title. They've got their title for discipline if they ever need it, but they rarely use it. I've used this example in one of my classes. I've just been promoted to president of a company. And usually when an individual comes in at the top, that's when the shenanigans start taking place. This is when people start moving around almost like an earthquake to find out who can get away with this. You know, it's like adolescence with a, with a substitute teacher. You know, they try to see what they could get away with. Well, okay, here it comes. Uh, I tell everybody, look, folks, I don't know what you did in the past. That's all, you know, that's, that's all gone. But we're, I want you in this boat, and we're going north. And I see this guy from the corner of my eye going south. Well, I'm a pretty decent guy, so I, I bring him over, and I say, hey, fella, excuse me. You must have misunderstood. We're going north. You're going south. Please get in the boat. So next thing you know, I turn my back, and I notice him going south again. And I say, excuse me. Exactly what is it that you don't understand? I said we're going north. Now please get in the boat. I turn my back a little while later. He's going south. What should I do? What should I do? I've been decent to him two times. I counseled him. I talked to him. Please get in the boat. What should I do? Tell me what I should do. What penalty? Take his hands out and slap them. Give me your hands. No, no. No, what should I do? Tell me, what should I do? I am the authority. I chose, I chose not to use it up until now. So what do I do? Norway, talk to me. What am I going to do? What should I do? Say that again? Get off the boat. Permanently. You're right. Shake hands. You're going back to Norway, a good leader. That's good. I'm going to fire him. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You know what? He did me a favor. Now, Norway, I want you to tell me why he did me a favor. He did me a favor. Go ahead, think. There are no wrong answers in here. There are just answers. He did me a favor. Why did he do me a favor? Talk to me. Why did he, he did me a favor? Why did he do me a favor? You don't have to keep going back and trying to... That's one. I don't have... Well, I'm not going to go back. But he did me a favor. A big favor. What? Talk to me. Yeah, say that again. Who said it? Yeah, he used me. I used him. He gave me an example. Do you know what? Because I had the courage to fire him, there's a message to the whole organization. What's the message? Joe's a nice guy, but don't confuse that niceness with weakness. I may never, ever, in 10 years, I may be the leader there. I may never, after ever have to discipline a person like that again. Why? Because they understand. He's nice, but don't cross him. That's what I want. He did me a favor. As a matter of fact, I might have paid him. Do something, will you? So therefore, we understand. Influence is better than authority, but you might have to use it on that very small percentage. Now the problem is this. If you only have influence and you don't have authority, you're in trouble. Now, what do I mean by influence and no authority? You're the nurse. She has no authority. But we find through research that, that nurses can have incredible influence in an organization. Incredible. As a matter of fact, even sometimes more than the top person. Because everybody likes to talk to the nurse. And when the nurse listens, that gives her some kind of influence because she can give advice. So what do I do now if I only have influence? I'll give you an example. A professor has no authority except on the last day when he or she administers grades. Tell me what authority a professor's got. I tried to get a couple of kids kicked out of class once because I didn't like their behavior. I found out how much authority I've got. I was told they paid their, they paid their, their tuition, they have a right to stay. I've got to deal with them. Okay. On that day of grades is the only authority. So what do I deal with? I have to have influence. If I don't have influence, I'm in trouble. We're in trouble if we have influence and people don't buy it. But here's the problem. Here's, here's the point. How do we develop this influence? 
once you've got it, most people will follow your influence and you won't have too, many, too much trouble. Even if you have influence and no authority, talking to people who um, are defiant often helps. Often helps. But there are some you'll just have to say, look, you need to find somebody else. You need to go somewhere else. I mean, you need to do something else because I just don't have what you're looking for because I have no authority. If I am a leader with no authority and people don't follow me, I've got difficulty. But this works for the most. We have to go with the majority, not those you know, not those small, minuscule numbers. We've got to go with because you cannot please everybody. Ronald Reagan used to say, we can't convince 100% of Americans it's Sunday on Sunday. So there's no way we could convince everybody about anything. Now, how can I develop influence? I'm going to use a three-legged stool because, remember, influence gives us power. I'm going to use a three-legged stool as a model for developing power. The first leg is going to be competence. Competence. The leader has to have some competence in something that is considered valuable. I mean, if I'm... If I've been appointed as leader over a group of, um, shall we say, accountants, and my background is geography, yeah, I'm going to have trouble. They're going to say, you know, how's this guy going to help us with our problems in finance? You know, especially if the first couple of people come and ask me a question. And I say, uh, go see Bob. Bob will talk to you. Go see Phyllis. She'll talk to you. People have got the idea right away. I, I'm not too, too swift. So I'm beginning to lose something that I need very badly. The second leg is respect. Got to have respect. Got to get respect. It's very difficult to lead without respect. If you lead without respect, you have to have a whip, knife, or a gun to get people to do what you want them to do. And then they do it by obligation. And that means you'd better have authority. Because if I've only got power, I don't have that. Sorry. I don't have it. Once I have some competence in something that is perceived to be valuable, and I have respect, here comes the big one. I develop trust. When I have those three, I want to tell you, it's amazing what people would do for me. It is amazing what people would do for me as the leader. It is amazing. They would walk through hot coals because they believe in me. They trust me. So now let's talk about what is it that can give us the trust, the respect, and it's understood I've got the competence. I'm going to call this a kind of behavior that we will see in the leader who develops power and influence called encouraging. Encouraging leadership. Encouraging leadership behavior. That's what's going to give it to me. Encouraging leadership behavior. There's an interesting book by Dinkmeyer called The Encouragement Book. Part of this I've drawn from there, part of it I've drawn from experience. So I've come up with what I would call six, six behaviors that I would call encouraging leadership behaviors, and I'd like to share them with you, that the utilization of these behaviors should bring the leader an incredible amount of power because these behaviors will create influence. Six of them. 
The first of the six encouraging behaviors is the following. It's an understanding on the part of the leader that leadership is a people business. I repeat, that's the first and foremost thing you have to walk out of this class understanding. Leadership is a people business. I'm going to give to Dr. Perigin a couple of articles I have had published in the last year. One is called The Real Work of the Leader, The Human Side of the Equation. And it's all about a model, an eight-sided model, that I and a few other people developed to look at exactly what is the people responsibility of a leader. We know that leaders have the responsibility for the bottom line, for quality, for product, all that stuff. But whoever has pointed out exactly what is the people responsibility of a leader? Well, we have developed it. It actually won an award in 2008 as one of the four best articles published that year by the Journal of Management and Development. I will get Sue a copy of it so she could give it to you. And there will be a couple of other articles in there for you. The first thing that the encouraging leader understands is leadership is a people business. If you don't like people, it's the wrong place for you. I repeat, if you don't like people, it's, it's a bad place for you. Not a good place. Because people are going to want your attention. And if you don't like giving attention, uh, you're going to have some difficulties. And they'll create the difficulties for you. Number one, again, is leadership is a people business, but here comes an axiom that is absolutely important for the leadership to understand. Listen to this concept. It is absolutely crucial to success in leadership. The purpose of leadership is to create stars, not become one. I repeat myself. The purpose of leadership is to create stars, not become one. Boy, there are a lot of leaders who pro who've never heard of that. Purpose of leadership is to create stars, not become one. <laughs> okay, I'm with a group of leaders, and I say to them, I'd like to give you an example of what I'm talking about, about the difference between becoming a star and creating a star, creating stars. My team has engineered great profits this past year. I have a team of seven or eight people, and we have under us hundreds of people. The chairman of the board of directors has invited us to a meeting of the stockholders, and they're going to pay tribute to me and my team for this wonderful year we had last year. So I'm going to go through a scenario for you, and I want to show you what lousy leadership is like and what better leadership is like. Okay. So it's time after dinner, the chairman of the board says the following. He says, ladies and gentlemen, stockholders, please come to attention. Tonight we want to honor this man, Ken Jimmy, for all the work his team did this past year, giving us a great year of profits. Joe, would you kindly stand up? So I'm standing up. And he's starting to sing my praises. Joe did this and Joe did that. And while he's doing that, I am absolutely lapping it all up. Okay, Joe, you can sit down. Thank you very much. That is lousy leadership. Let me give you a better example. The chairman calls everyone to attention and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we want to honor this man, Mr. Kanjemi, for all the work he's done this past year. Joe, would you kindly stand up? Ladies and gentlemen, Joe, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I mean no offense, but would you give me a minute? Mm -hmm. Bob, stand up, please. Mary, would you kindly stand up? Phil, please stand up. Charlene, would you kindly stand up, please? Daniel, please stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the people who deserve your applause. I was fortunate enough to be their leader. But these are the ones who created what you have this year. They are the stars here, not I. Please join me in giving them an applause. The number one item. The leader is there to create stars, not to become one. Next. The second point is, the encouraging leader understands the following. It is absolutely essential to be transparent, to be an inclusive leader. 
What do I mean by this? Transparent leaders hide very little. They want to share as much as possible with people. They want people to know what's going on. They enjoy talking to people. We're going to take a lesson now from the Japanese. The Japanese have a leadership style, part of their leadership style, which is worth talking about. The Japanese believe in leadership by walking around. The Japanese believe you cannot lead from your office. You must get out of your office and go around and see what's going on. It's, it, it, it serves many purposes. First of all, people see that you are interested. By you getting around, it shows that you're interested. It also shows that you care because we stop in somebody's office and say, Hey man, how's it going? Did you see the game yesterday? Wow, pretty good, huh? What's going on in your department? Anything new? The point is he's going around, she's going around, listening, looking. This is very good because now no one can fool him. Do you realize if you stay in your office all the time as a leader, you can be fooled because you are subject to the information coming in. And if that information is tainted, you really don't know what's going on. You are going to be held hostage in your own office. Inclusive means you want to share with people. How would you like working for an exclusive leader? Let me tell you what one is like. Number one, he never leaves his office. Number two, he doesn't share. Number three, he creates circumstances that reward him and not you, and you don't even know about it. To this day, a gentleman tells me that his exclusive leader cheated him out of a quarter of a million dollars. And he did it and got away with it because he never shared any information with people. That same exclusive leader prohibited his people from saying good morning when they come in. He said to them, your job is not to socialize. Your job is to get to your desk and work. You might say, why would people stay? Isn't that a good question? Why would people stay working for someone like that? Well, they do. They do. Your guess is as good as mine, and we could probably talk toss this around for a half hour. Why would people stay? It's just easier to adjust to what's there than to go out and find a new job, isn't it? Especially if you've got a wife and children, a husband and children. It's easier. You just learn to adjust. But the next question is, how productive are these people? Shall we go to the beginning? Only 29% of American workers are fully engaged. 71% are partially engaged. How much of that is in this? Good question. The second point is the encouraging leader is transparent, shares information, likes to explain things, asks for information. Here's one big point. The transparent leader never lies. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know the damage of a lie to you as a leader? You will never get over it. You will never get over it. Okay, you tell me what I should do. I am the head of a department of 100 people. The company is undergoing financial difficulties. Rumor has it, and by the way, the rumor on the factory floor, the company floor, is so accurate it isn't funny. It's called the grapevine. Research shows the grapevine, you ready for this, is 80% accurate. Which means I, as a leader, if I want to know what's going on, I might just go out on the floor and say, hey guys, what's going on? Because they may know before me. Don't ask me how, but it happens. Well, here it is. People on the floor know we are going to downsize. I have to get rid of 10 people. I don't, it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. This goes on in the business world. I am told you will get rid of 10. What will happen if I say I'm not going to get rid of these 10? What will happen? They'll get rid of me. And they'll bring someone in who's going to do it. And that's just the way it works. It's not a university. Here you can, get, here you can do all kinds of things you will never do. The moment, you know, the moment that you step out. Wow, it's a different world. You can even feel it before you take that first step. It's a different world out there. 
So guess what? I now know I've got to get rid of 10. And guess what? I've even got the names. So here we go. What's your name? Jerry. Jerry. Jerry comes to me and he says, Joe, we know that you've got to get rid of some people. I want to buy a new car. Joe, am I on that list? Joe, you've got to tell me, am I on that list? Joe, should I buy my new car? Come on, Joe, don't let me spend $20,000 if I'm going to be on that list. And guess what? I do know who's on that list, and his name is on it. Please help me. What do I do? He's a nice guy, and I'm a nice guy. I'm a guy with influence. I like, you know, I like treating people nicely. So what do I do? Tell the truth. What should I tell him, Norway? Don't buy the car. If I did that, I could be fired. You know why? Because I violated a trust in me by my superior. But I shouldn't lie. I didn't say he had to lie. I never said that. I don't agree with lying. I agree with omitting, but not lying. What should I do? But he can read between the lines there. Reading between the lines there, he's going to go to the negative side. He's going, to, well, I guess I can't. I guess I'm on that list. I can't tell him that. What should I do? I don't believe in lying. What should I do? You had your hand up, or were you were you scratching? No, I tell him you can't tell him the list. Can't tell who's on the list. Just like that. Just look at him and say sorry. Sorry, I can't tell you if you're on the list. Or not. You want to go over there and tell him? I don't. <laughs> no. That's exactly what I would do. I'd say, old buddy, I know you want to know. And I wish I could tell you. But management directives suggest that list can't be revealed until the 1st of March. I'm sorry. Yes, I do know. But I'm obligated. And you understand. I hope you understand. I can't tell you one way or another. Don't buy the car. <laughs> why I don't believe in lying and I can't violate the trust that was given to me by my leaders exclusive people they're tough to work for and yet many of them get promoted they seem to get the job done On the door of an exclusive leader is this sign. And I mentioned it earlier, but I'll mention it again. If this door is closed and you open it, the building had better be on fire. That's an exclusive leader. Believe me, she doesn't want anything to do with people. Next, the third characteristic of an encouraging leader is the encouraging leader has a good sense of how to deal with people. You know, that's not hard if you like people. If you don't like people, that's pretty hard. I repeat, a good sense of how to work with people if you don't like people, that's pretty hard. But if you like people, you could learn quickly. You would learn quickly because it's not a problem for you to learn how to deal better with people. I... Um, in one of my classes, I talk about organizational politics, and I say smart people understand that there are politics in every organization. And um, my definition of politics is the ability to get what you want without offending people. I repeat, the ability to get what you want without offending people. And so you know, there are certain rules that we have to follow in organizations with a good sense of people. For example, a person with a good sense will understand the following and why it makes some sense. You never embarrass your boss in public. Why? You never put your boss in a corner, even if you're right, because you can't win. You don't do that. Okay? And so therefore, people with a good sense of people 
tend to get along very well with people. These are some of their qualities. They are not quick to anger. They are not quick to anger. They are patient. They have empathy for people. They have compassion. They are not fools, and they don't suffer fools lightly, but they can understand. Example, Bob has been a terrific employee for seven years. The last few months, he's not doing so well. But I find out he's undergoing a divorce and his wife ran off with the kids. Well, most people, if it's she who's getting a divorce and he ran off with the kids, what difference would it make? The suggestion is who is at his or her best under those circumstances. And the likelihood is some of that's going to show up at work. And so therefore, understanding that and helping him or her to get through it, perhaps by encouraging him or her to seek professional help, is valuable. And it will commit this person to this leader probably forevermore because the leader understood at a time when he or she needed understanding. Having a good sense of people suggests two things. One, this encouraging leader has a good sense of humor. And what do I mean by a good sense of humor? Oh, I don't mean laughing at my jokes or anybody else's jokes. That's easy. A good sense of humor means that I can laugh at myself. That is a good sense of humor, that I can laugh at myself and I don't take myself too seriously. Okay. <clears throat> I make a mistake and I laugh. Oof, I can't believe it. I did it again. Wow. That I can laugh at myself, admit I've made some mistakes, admit I made the mistake. I want to tell you, my experience in the business world is this. There are few leaders who can admit they made a mistake. I talked to a guy yesterday who messed up, and I said to him, call the man up and tell him you made a mistake. He says, I'm not calling him up and telling him I made a mistake. Okay, sorry. But that's the difference in leaders. A really good leader can say, hey, fella, I messed up. It's my fault. I'll take care of it. The poorer leaders, it wasn't me, it was Joe. Yeah, it was Bob. It was Mary, you know. She's undergoing a divorce. What do you expect from her? Okay. Yeah, those are the poor leaders. The next part of number three is a good sense of dealing with people is the word attitude. Let's talk about attitude. You have no conception of how significant that word is. A good attitude is contagious. You could walk into an organization, you could walk into a room, you could walk in with people who are sad, morose, and you could brighten them up by virtue of the fact you've got a more positive attitude. I do not agree with this kind of expression or response. How are you doing today, fella? I'm just great. How are you? Excuse me. Let's try that again. Can't you just say, I'm fine, thank you? You're going to tell me how wonderful you are? I'm not asking that. I just asked a simple question. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I always like, because I'm older than most people, I say, I'm not bad for a guy my age. Okay. In which case, in a way, I'm laughing at myself. Okay. A good attitude. Listen to the following. The only thing you will ever completely own is your attitude. I repeat. I want to repeat that. The only thing you will ever 100% completely own is your attitude. Nobody has your attitude. You are the one who creates it. If you allow other people to affect it, that's your choice. But your attitude is 100% yours. Viktor Frankl, a renowned psychiatrist whose entire family was murdered in the death camps during World War II by the Nazis. He is the only survivor. And he lived to tell what went on. And he was asked, how did he survive? 
He made up his mind. He was going to survive. Yet he talked about people who decided they didn't want to survive. And he talked about people who decided they didn't like what was going on so much they decided to die. And he talks about people who just laid down and died. Attitude. A positive attitude can really, really affect your organism. How many of you have heard of Peter Sellers, the actor? Uh, Steve Martin? Watch the attitude that comes your way by seeing a Steve Martin movie. Research shows us that if you will laugh, laugh a lot, you will strengthen your immune system. If you were to go to see a Steve Martin movie, research shows that you strengthen your immune system by up to two days. So let's compare that with a lousy attitude, bad attitude. If you were to see a morose movie, it weakens your immune system by 12 to 14 hours. The suggestion is you were meant to be happy. You were meant to have a good attitude because we have benefits from it. We strengthen our immune system. It may actually keep us alive longer. What is a morose movie? Can anyone think of one? I'll give you one, and it's worthwhile seeing. How many of you have seen the movie Munich? M-U-N-I-C-H. It comes from the book Vengeance. The book is well worthwhile reading, and the movie is well worthwhile seeing. But it will put you in a kind of down mood, but just remember, it's only going to last 12 to 14 hours. It's only going to last 12 to 14 hours. You know, go to a local bar and get a shot, and it'll help your immune system after, okay? Just kidding. But I'm not kidding about the movie Munich. It's depressing, but it's valuable because it's accurate. I've read the book. The fourth characteristic of the encouraging leader is the encouraging leader establishes open communication throughout the entire organization. What do I mean by that? If you'll take a look in your, just think in terms of communication. Communication flows east and west, colleague to colleague. It flows to the north, and that is from colleagues to the leader. It also flows south from the leader and colleagues down to subordinates. Good leaders want to hear from everybody as best as is possible, and they offer venues to get that communication to the top. But one very important point of leadership communication is this one, and this is a tough one. This will try and challenge the very best leader. The encouraging leader welcomes dissent. Welcomes dissent. Ladies and gentlemen, as leaders, we must prepare ourselves to listen to ideas that do not agree with ours. We must listen to leader we must listen to ideas that are very different from ours. Now, unfortunately, everyone's mother wasn't successful. And by that I mean they didn't teach them grace. They didn't teach them manners. So some people simply don't know how to disagree in, in an agreeable way. Some people can be very rough. It doesn't matter. The encouraging leader has to know how to, how to deal with that. Example, suppose I'm giving, I, I'm giving a rah-rah talk to my people and I say, Who's, what do you think about that? And some person, a male, female, and by the way, some of the worst behavior I'm finding out is coming from women. Oh. In a credit card company, women basically answer the phones. The verbiage they tell me that women use on the telephone when they call them up and ask them in a polite way when they're going to pay their bill, I cannot believe the language women are using on these women. I mean, I've been in the Navy. 
And I've never heard sailors talk this bad. Women. Unbelievable. The point is, suppose Charlie over here goes on a tirade and talks down to me as the leader. Remember one thing. As a leader, I must respect my people, and therefore I expect respect back. This person is showing me disrespect. If I take too much disrespect, I'm going to lose respect from everybody else because they're going to question if I've got the courage to deal with this. And I would merely say, Bob, look, you have every right to your point of view. But however, let's discuss this after this meeting. Okay, I want to get on with things. You seem to be pretty strong for your opinion, and I'll listen to it. But after the meeting, and when we're one-to-one, -one, I'm going to tell him, Bob, you have every right to disagree with me, but you will never, ever disagree with me with the disrespect that I saw coming from you. If you can't respect me, then I'm sorry. You'll have to meet with me one-to-one. -one. But if in the meetings, I expect that you could talk with respect. You can say anything you want. You can disagree with me all you want. But this is one thing that I expect. I will listen to everybody. And here comes the point of communications, ladies and gentlemen. The leader cannot have made up his mind ahead of time going through the motions that he is listening or she is listening because people will pick it up in your body language. They'll pick it up. Remember, body language, from many writers' point of view, is 100% accurate. Body language from the view of many writers is 100% accurate, so they'll pick it up in the body language, which means that if you ask for opinions, you had better be listening, because you're going to get them. And you know what? Some of them are better than yours. For you to say to your secretary or whoever, your administrative assistant, Mary, that's a great idea. Take it down. I, I think that's a great idea. Let's, let's look at that later. Let's take that down. But you know what I just did? I put myself in an obligatory position. If I'm taking it down, I have to get back with that person to tell that person what I'm going to do with it. Which is good, because it says that I'm authentic. I meant it. I must open the way for dissent. People must be able to dissent. A study was done to find out why people left their jobs. In a nationwide study, 65% of people who obtained a new position, stated their reason for obtaining the new position was lack of communication. They never found out what was going on in the company they left. Open communication, it means that I'm willing to listen, especially to people who don't agree with me. Why? What makes me think as the leader that I know everything? Boy, I'll tell you what, when that, when that happens, I'm in trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, I, as a person, I cannot outthink two of you. Imagine trying to outthink a whole group. That's crazy. I should be using that group for the benefit of the organization. Everyone has talent of sorts. Everyone has ability. I should be asking for that ability to be coming to my office. I can make better decisions. The fourth characteristic is open communications. The fifth one is the encouraging leader creates an environment where associates are free from fear. This is a big one. Free from fear. Free from the fear of being put down. Free from the fear of being humiliated. Free, free from the fear of sarcasm. Ladies and gentlemen, note this down. The definition of sarcasm is ripping of the flesh. The definition of sarcasm is ripping, tearing of the flesh. Nobody likes working in an environment where that is a fear. Actually, listen to this, research shows that people... Fear being humiliated in public more than they fear being fired. I repeat, they don't fear being fired as much as being humiliated. We must create an environment where people are free from fear. I want to recommend a movie to you, and I'll show you what fear can do. 
in this video, it's movie. It's called The Bedford Incident, and it's with Sidney Portier and Richard Widmark. It's the story of an American naval vessel patrolling apparently in the Arctic or the Antarctic, I'm not sure which, all that ice and snow around. And their job is to monitor what's going on under the ice, and they pick up a Russian submarine. But I should tell you, the captain, Richard Widmark, believes that the way that you train leaders is you make them tough, and the way you make them tough is you beat up on them. You criticize them. You beat them up in public. You make them tough. That is his way. Now, I didn't tell you what happens when human beings are fearful. Ladies and gentlemen, when we're fearful, our organism doesn't work well. People who fear do not see accurately. Their brain constricts. The eyes constrict. We do not see well. We do not hear well. Our organism becomes inferior. Of all the qualities that we've got, our organism becomes an inferior one. And so therefore, the ship captain, following this Russian submarine, decides he's going to teach this submarine captain a lesson, by golly. So he orders the entire crew to combat stations, battle stations. So obviously the submarine captain is watching this through his periscope, and he sees everyone going to battle stations. So what does he do? He calls all of his people to battle stations. So this young kid, scared to death now, because they're now in a situation of stress. It's a stressful situation, battle stations. It could mean your ship could be destroyed. So therefore, he's scared to death. And the, and the captain of the naval ship decides he's really going to give this, this uh, Russian captain something to worry about. He's going to start preparing for action. So he yells to this ensign, scared to death, prepare to fire one. What do you think this fearful young officer heard? Fire one! And there we go. An atomic warhead on its way to a Russian submarine. The submarine captain was aware what was going on. What do you think he did? He fired his, and here we go. We must create environments as leaders where people are free of fear. They must be free of fear. Fear of the leader. How sad. Ladies and gentlemen, I was in an office in Rome, Italy, doing some work one summer. I heard a noise that scared me. It frightened me. The noise came from a room that was probably no farther than that wall. I was in the room of the uh, controller. I said to him, Tony, what was that noise? It was frightening. It sounded like I was in a zoo. Frightening noise. It sounded like an animal. He said, that's the boss. He's getting on one of his managers. That's the boss. He's getting on one of his managers. Wow. I've never heard a sound like that in my life, and I hope I never hear another one. That a human being could do that to another human being is unacceptable. I'm sorry. I'd like you to take these three sentences down because they'll be with you the rest of your life, and they will affect you. They will affect you. I may forget what you said to me. I may forget what you did to me. But I will never forget the way you made me feel. I may forget what you said to me. I may forget what you did to me. But I will never forget the way you made me feel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why 20 years later some people can't stand others. And they don't even know why. It's because they can't remember what was said. They can't remember what was done. But they remember the feeling. Encouraging leaders understand that. We don't say anything to anybody that could really destroy their feelings. We don't do that. I may have to fire you, and I will if I have to, if I'm the leader. 
You're going to have to put me in that position, and when you do, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to bring you in, and I'm not going to do what some people do. I would like to be a fly on the wall to hear what happened at the post office when someone was terminated or whatever company, and the person comes back with an AK-47 and wipes out 13 or 14 people. I guarantee you what was said to that person at that time was not something that could be repeated. I guarantee you. Why? Because people with low self-esteem, self-esteem that is hanging on a thread, have very low self-worth. You start messing with that, they may come back and get you. I may forget what you said, I may forget what you did, but I will never forget the way you made me feel. You can find people 20, 30 years later not liking somebody and they can't even remember what was done. They can't remember what was said, but that feeling is there. And if they could go through hypnosis, you'd probably be able to dig it out, but it's gone. But not the feeling. How do we develop this environment that is free from fear? Two words. Recognition and praise. Those are the two keys that develop this environment that is free from fear, that is creativity oriented, that encourages people to, be, to, to let loose, get motivated to do the things that you want to do, create, think, offer, recognition and praise. And here's the best part of it. <laughs> they are free. Applause is free. Now here comes something I also want you to write down. You are all smart people. I don't have to tell you this. We all need to reward goal attainment. You know that, don't you? Goal attainment. Guess what? There is something even more important to reward. We must start learning to reward as leaders effort and improvement, effort and improvement, effort and improvement. If I keep rewarding effort and improvement, what am I going to get? The goal. We must start rewarding effort and improvement, effort and improvement. Finally, there's a formula here to create that kind of environment. A guy by the name of Robert Angelos sent me this model many years ago to create that environment. Watch this. A minimum of 80% of all the experience in the environment must be positive. To create that kind of environment, a minimum of 80% of the experiences people undergo every day must be positive. A maximum of only 20% can be negative. And finally, the last characteristic, since it's time for you to go, I'm going to skip over some notes I have. I can't get it all in. So I'm going to go to the last one. The last characteristic is the leader. The leader must model the behavior he or she expects from others. The leader must model the behavior he or she expects from others. It's not like some mothers and fathers are quoted as saying, don't do as I do, do as I say. You can't get away with that as a leader. If you want, if you want people to be at work at 8 o'clock, you'd better be there before 8. If you want people to stay after 4, at 5, to be there until 5, you'd better stay there. If they see you coming in late with great frequency, you'll lose them, and they won't respect you. So the six characteristics summed up, number one, of the encouraging leader. Leaders must understand they are there to create stars, not become one. Two, they are to be inclusive and transparent. Number three, they have to develop good people skills. They need a good sense of humor, and they have a good sense of humor and a good attitude. Number four, they encourage open communication, especially dissent. Number five, they create an environment that is free from fear, that encourages creativity. And they understand 80% of the experiences every day should be positive. 
And number six, they understand. They must model what they expect from others. In closing, I'd like to read this quote that was made of Admiral Chester Nimitz, who was the chief of naval operations right after World War II, and the admiral in charge of the Pacific Fleet that was victorious in the Pacific during World War II. At his passing, the following was said. About Admiral Chester Nimitz, he had wielded enormous power without arrogance or ostentation. A leader who had remained simple, friendly, approachable. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that could be said about any leader, anywhere, in any organization, is the legacy that would be wonderful for each of us to attain. Thank you.